Christina, can you move to the next slide? So welcome everyone to our DBE certification webinar. My name is Christina Kunkel. I'm the program director for the Nor Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Today, we are thrilled to have our senior lead procurement specialist, Christina Jones, who has personally prepared countless DBE applications for clients. She's a true expert in this topic. So before we get started, I'm just gonna briefly talk about the services that are available to you through the PTAC and through our DBE Supportive Services Program. Next slide. So the NorCal PTAC is a nonprofit program of the NorCal SBDC. The PTAC is funded primarily by the Defense Logistics Agency with supplemental funding from Caltrans and GoBiz and other federal, state, and local funds. We are hosted by Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation in Arcata, California. And the NorCal PTAC provides three core services, all of which are free to clients within our service area. The first is one-on-one -on -one counseling. Our specialists can help you with anything from SAM registration, small business minority, veteran and other certifications, uh, GSA schedules, crafting capability statements, getting a DUNS number, anything government contracting related to help you succeed in the government marketplace. If after today you determine that you'd like to pursue the DBE application, one of our specialists can walk you through the complex process and make sure your application has a high chance of acceptance. We can sit down with you individually and help you understand where your business fits in the government marketplace, who to market yourself to, and how to market yourself. We also have a paid subscription for a program that aggregates all federal, state, local, and school district purchases. And we can provide custom reports to our clients at no cost to help you determine who's buying what you're selling and help, it target your, help you target your marketing. Second, we provide free in-person and virtual workshops like this one on government contracting topics. These webinars and workshops are always free. We'll show you some upcoming events at the end of this presentation. And third, we can set up those within our service area with a free bid matching email service with daily access to federal, state, local, and even prime contractor opportunities. Next slide, please. So we are funded to provide free services to businesses in the counties listed in the green map. Um, as of September 2018, we officially added all Bay Area counties to our service area. My office is located in Arcata, so that's the red star on this map here, but my expert specialists are located all over the Western US, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Monterey, even New Mexico and Washington State. So I searched the nation for the, the top experts in this field to get you the best service possible. Um, all counseling is provided remotely via phone or video conference, so you don't need to leave your home or office to receive assistance. We also received a contract to specifically assist those who are already certified as DBEs and help them win more contracts with transportation agencies like Caltrans, BART, High Speed Rail, transit authorities, local governments, and more. So that's this map on the right here. Um, through this program, we can also assist you in preparing a complete DBE application. That's probably the interest for most of the people attending this webinar today. So our service area for that program is shown on the right. It covers Caltrans districts one, two, three, and four. Our project administrator for the DBE program is on the call today. Her name is Stacy Richardson, and she will also be available for questions about the DBE program during the Q&A at the end of today's session. Next slide. So to apply for NorCal PTAC services, it's really easy. You just visit our website, click on the big apply now button. You'll be contacted via email within three business days and assigned to a procurement specialist if you're accepted. Just a note, if you've ever worked with the SBDC before, you may have trouble logging into the system. And if that happens, just send us an email. Um, and like I said, I'll be sending out these slides. So all of these links and uh, websites and all that, you'll have access to that um, within a day or two. Next slide. So you're all muted right now for sound quality, but if you have questions during the presentation, just use the chat function. 
I will unmute you at the end and we'll have 10 to 20 minutes for your questions. After the session, you'll receive a link with a brief survey through SurveyMonkey, Sur SurveyMonkey, and we appreciate your feedback. So let's get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce Christina Jones, our Senior Lead Procurement Specialist with the NorCal PTAC. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, yeah, I'm Christina Jones, and I'm the Lead Procurement Specialist with the NorCal PTAC. Um, some of you, I've seen a few of you that have logged into the call, have attended other workshops or webinars where I've talked in some detail or maybe briefly about the DBE program. But today, I'm going to get into some real detail about the program. Um, whether or not you qualify, how the certification can benefit you, and so forth. So here's part one of our agenda, what we're going to cover today. So most importantly, we're going to review the program objectives as, as defined in this um, FAR ruling, 49 CFR 26. This is the um, regulation that regulates this program, that de determines whether you're eligible. We'll talk about the program benefits and review specifically six eligibility requirements. These are the high level um, overview of the requirements that you need to meet in order to qualify. Um, and then we'll move into the application, which will, I always like to start with, and this is all personal to you, but I like to start with gathering what's required. So gathering what required, what's required helps you with completing the actual application. So we'll review the requirement checklist and documents required uh, specifically under different formation types. So whether you're an LLC, an S Corp, a sole proprietor, we'll talk a little bit about how the documentation differs. And then for number five here, we'll review a sample DBE application. So, and this will be the application that will be available to you um, on Caltrans website, which should be as part of um, a link in the resource slide that's at the end of this presentation. For part two, we'll continue with the putting together an application virtually, um, reviewing the personal financial statement, what's required there, um, and then we'll review a sample of a fully assembled package. And then for the, the final steps, we'll discuss a site visit because each application, each applicant is required um, to have a site visit by someone from Caltrans. We'll discuss what to expect, some types of questions that they ask. And then we'll talk about what to do if you receive a clarification letter. What are your steps for response? It's basically going to revolve around the regulations, making sure you respond to the regulations that they um, list in the letter as far as things that you need to clarify. We'll talk about how you maintain certification, and then, as Christina Kunkel mentioned, we'll have a Q&A session, so you can um, ask any questions that you have about the program. So let's get started. So Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, for those of you who aren't aware, the DBE program, it was established by Congress in 1983 with legislation that aspires, and I say aspires, to have 10% of Department of Transportation funds for highway and transit federal finance, financial assistance programs to be expended with DBEs. So contract awards to be given to certified DBE firms. Um, each state can actually set their own more aggressive goal and the state of California currently has a goal of 12.5% to be expended to DBEs. So a DBE firm as it mentions here is a firm that is for profit, nonprofits don't qualify, and at least 51% owned and controlled by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. So socially typically has to do with a minority status and economically based on being um, within the personal net worth requirements, which we will review. So the program is designed, as it mentions here, to ensure that small firms can, DBE certified firms can compete fairly on federally funded transportation related projects and hopefully to help you grow and assist you in business development as far as, you know, just um, the overall um, ability of your, of your company to compete um, on projects and public works. So the purpose, so each program, so the uh, DBE program is nationwide. However, each state has its own program. So for the state of California, it's California Unified Certification Program. 
a CUCP, which sometimes can be confused if any of you have a certification with supplier clearinghouse with CPUC. Um, so that one's for the, the public utilities, and here we're talking about the unified certification program that California administers for Caltrans. So the purpose of this program is to provide one-stop shopping of certification services to socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Throughout this presentation, you'll hear a lot about socially and economically disadvantaged because that is the theme and the basis for this certification. You'll also hear a lot about owned and controlled and specifically about controlled. So we'll speak, um, we'll talk more about that, um, why it's important that you not only own the business, but you control the business. So we'll get into that as we move through the slides. And I kind of mentioned this briefly, but it's governed by 49 CFR part 26. And we'll talk, and so each state puts that into practice, but we'll talk specifically about how that relates to you as far as qualifying for the certification. So the objectives of the program, again, under 49 CFR Part 26, is to ensure non-discrimination in the award and administration of DLT-assisted contracts um, for highway transit and airport programs. Now, there are other agencies outside of transportation that do recognize the DBE certification. We'll talk a little bit about that, but the primary pur purpose is to assist firms that work in um, highway transit and airport programs. So what are the benefits of this certification? Why go through all of this? Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. For instance, if you're in construction, prime contractors, a lot of the opportunities that they pursue have a DBE requirement. So they are looking for certified disadvantaged business enterprise firms, um, of course, that are qualified to do the work as well. So beyond having the certification, I always say you need to first be qualified to do the work to really have the true benefit of whatever certification you are pursuing. So that's one of the first opportunities and one of the primary opportunities under DBE. Um, increased visibility. So agencies are more, um, will actually reach out to you at times being a DBE certified firm. Um, also more visibility when you attend procurement fairs, matchmaking, when you present your capability statement, which is your, your one page business flyer, for instance, for the government that tells them what you do, listing that you're a DBE certified firm also notes that you've been, um, you've been um, they've reviewed your paperwork and underwritten and, term, and determined that you actually are a disadvantaged business enterprise. And that's again, what we'll be talking about thing today about being underwritten and, and require, um, excuse me, meeting the requirements for this cert. Pre-bid meetings, again, primes attend these meetings and it's an opportunity for you to network with them let them know that you're certified as a DBE. So beyond being able to um, be the painting contractor as a, as a sub, you can also help them meet their uh, DBE goals um, if they you know, choose to um, use you on the contract. So I talked a little bit about this on a previous slide, but other than um, transportation projects, you know, state, cities, local government agencies, many of these other the entities here recognize DBE certification. And a lot of that is because DBE has a very rigorous program to underwrite you and to confirm that you are in fact owned and controlled by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. So it's not a self-certification program. It's not something that you can um, click through and make, in, a, in other words, state what you are and they just assume that those things are true of self-certification. It's a fully underwritten program. And like I said, they do come out and do a site visit and ask lots of questions to confirm what was um, listed on your application, what they've researched matches up to what's um, occurring in your office. So that makes the certification that more valuable to other cities and local counties and so forth that um, know and that once you've gone through this rigorous process that you are actually a certified firm. So here are the minimum qualifications, and I say minimum because they actually can ask for anything. If something that you list on your application uh, causes them to question, you know, to, uh, causes other questions to open up, they can send you a clarification at, um, letter and ask for, you know, clarification of that issue. But in general, the, these are the, the, the five 
general qualifications. Um, small business concern, you must be small as defined by the Small Business Act. And all of these, um, these requirements in the end lead back to a regulation. So just be familiar with the regulations as they um, pertain to whichever certification you're applying, specifically for this one for DBE. Um, so you must be a small business and the Small Business Act, this 13 CFR part 121, will lead you back basically to the list of NAICS codes, the North American Industry Classification System codes. And those basically describe the product or service that you sell and what is the maximum, maximum sales revenue that you can have and still be considered a small business. So that's step one. Step two, you must be 51% or more owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Again, I kind of explained social um, status as well as economic status, which is actually uh, mentioned in the third bullet, which is personal net worth of the applicant not to exceed 1.32 million. So um, <clears throat> that would exclude your um, equity in your primary residence, but it would not exclude, for instance, like your 401k, where some other certs would um, um, exclude that. So something to remember. Um, you must be a U.S. citizen or a resident alien, and you must have three year, your three-year average annual gross receipts from the firm or not to exceed 23.98 million um, for the construction industry, which is typically general, but amounts may vary for other industries. And the underwriting, the person underwriting your application will let you know if there is, um, they have applied a different standard um, for your industry. So the nice thing is that um, there is an annual renewable requirement, a form that you need to complete, but technically your DBE certification, once you're certified, never expires. So these are the, the current certifying agencies. Um, Caltrans, of course, is the headquarter agency that certifies, but these other agencies also participate in underwriting your application, depending on what region you're in. Um, and they would also coordinate the site visit. So if your application is sent to SFMTA, SFMTA would be the one that would be corresponding with you and also coordinate and come out for your site visit. Um, so, Currently, just something that a lot of times companies, and even if you look at Caltrans website, it'll say, you know, send your application, there's a link to send it to Caltrans in Sacramento. But, you know, under current processing times, or I, I guess the workload, they are really uh, sending those applications into the region that they belong. So, um, for instance, if your applicant, where you're located, is the San Francisco area then, and it's, you know, the area that Bay Area Rapid Transit, BART services, then your application will truly go there, not necessarily to um, the headquarters. So let's talk about eligibility. So again, I want you to remember this because if you do receive a clarification letter, nine times out of 10, it's gonna reference this 49 CFR part 26. Subpart D actually outlines certification standards, what is required. The burden of proof is on you. Governing rules for group membership, it talks about in group membership being whether um, your social disadvantage, your minority status. Um, size determination, we talked a little bit about how you determine whether or not you're small. Your social and economic disadvantage, ownership and control, and any other rules affecting certification that they can determine as they're underwriting your application. Okay, six requirements must be met. Again, these are the high level requirements and what the way you answer these um, questions may you know, bring forth other questions. So the first one is social and economic disadvantage. Um, you must be a US citizen, as I mentioned, or a resident alien, and you must be meet the federal definition of a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. And that's outlined in this particular FAR, but in general, again, it's primarily based off of a minority or women, I'm sorry, and women's, women owned. So women and minorities are socially uh, disadvantaged generally. And in some cases under certain uh, circumstances, other um, entities or other um, ethnicities that are not included within socially um, in the social status as normally recognized, or um, also LGBTQ may be considered, but those are on a case-by-case -case basis. 
and economically disadvantaged, which we um, just looked at the personal network um, uh, limitations that you have there. And the presumptive groups, again, that's just another word for what we're talking about, the women and uh, minority owned firms. So your personal net worth would be your requirement number two. You must have a personal net worth, again, of less than 1.32 million and excludes ownership interest in the firm. So you would be able to exclude that. And of course, I mentioned also equity in your primary residence. And collective assets, just so you know, may disqualify you even if you meet personal net worth limits. So what that means is that if you, for instance, have, you know, um, a boat or, you know, just as hypothetically or some um, valuable asset that if you were to um, liquidate it, you know, would make your assets quite, you know, exceed this personal net worth limit, they could determine that when they look at your collective assets, the, the real net worth that you may disqualify. Um, I haven't really seen this much that someone has disqualified under this, but, you know, I want to make you aware because we, it just depends on your particular situation. And I also want you to be aware of that, that they can ask for things that outside of these six requirements that we're covering. Size standard, we talked about that. And for the firm, the annual gross receipts not to exceed 23.98 million um, in the previous three fiscal years. So we talked already a little bit about that, but that's the standard. Ownership and control. Um, I like to really, you know, focus a little bit on this because particularly in control on, and control. So first, majority ownership. The firm must be owned and controlled by at least 51% by a socially economically disadvantaged individual or group of individuals. So maybe there are two of you that are Hispanic and you're going in as a group of individuals that are qualifying as um, the applicant. Um, but the real test here is control. So um, if, for instance, there's a husband and wife that own it, and the wife of course, is applying as a woman-owned um, DBE, and the husband, and they own a construction firm, the husband owns, has the, um, is the um, manager on the license, on the license with the state licensing board, and he actually manages the projects. He's out on the projects. She's in the office. Maybe she uh, manages the office, the payroll, um, the taxes, things of that nature. So in sometimes situations like that, they will determine that, that um, the woman doesn't in fact control the company because the license is what makes, makes that business exist. So if it's a, a C license that's required to do work, then if that C license is, if that husband leaves, then really that business sort of cease, ceases to exist. So just something to consider when you're considering um, whether or not you control the firm. It's more than just putting 51% ownership um, with the person who would qualify. So, and that speaks to the second bullet, which it must be real substantial and continuing going beyond pro forma ownership of the firm. So, and they can see that sometimes within your resume, which will have um, list your daily business operations, what you do, you know, for instance, it will list the company name, ABC Corporation, and what your daily activities are. Are you out on, on the job? Are you the final say on um, what occurs within the business? So beyond your title, what it is that you're doing, um, in the business that shows that you control it. I think there's something here in the chat. How about retirement plans and IRAs and others? Um, no, those would um, not be excluded. Okay. Requirement number five is independence. So the firm must have independence and control of its own operation meaning that um, you are not a subsidiary of a larger firm, for example, that really is providing all your resources, providing perhaps your employees, providing perhaps your bonding, things of that sort. Um, that really means that they control you. So perhaps you do have a company that you're partnered with and they do have some control of you, 
but you would be considered as one firm. So basically we call that affiliation. So you'd be affiliated with that firm. So all of their, you know, financial and um, information, their employees and so forth, you, collectively, you would, if you were still a small business, then you could apply. But if that firm in fact is large or becomes large because of the addition of you, then, you know, you wouldn't qualify. So just to, you know, consider whether or not you're an independent firm and whether or not you are sharing resources or requiring support from some other company that may um, make you appear dependent. Number six is management and control. So the DBE owners must perfect, uh, possess the power to direct a cause or direction of management policies. And I did talk about this as well, um, making the day-to-day -day decisions. So again, this will a lot of times reflect, reflect it, excuse me, in your resume. Um, and even in there's charts, which we'll cover within the actual application where you can check off different areas. They ask you specifically who's, who's doing what. So as far as the applicant, is this something that you do always, you do never, you do rarely. So they do, you know, it's really um, a lot of um, focus on control of the business. All right, so let's kind of look at the application and the certification process with Caltrans. So I'm just gonna act as if we're going on to Caltrans's website and what I would do first to kind of make sure that I qualify. So first I would click on, for DBE certification, click here. Now you can also see here, this it'll repeat it when we go through the slides, but on the first page, they're again reminding you of the, um, the initial requirements that you need to meet in order to move forward. And also we'll, we'll do that here. So again, all states have a DBE program, and so we're looking at California. And then these are the boxes that need to be checked off if you do qualify. All uh, five of these need to be checked. And we just reviewed these um, when we went over the steps um, on 49 CFR. Um, we just reviewed the, the six requirements that basically they cover these. So 51%, again, ownership and control. The business is an existing for-profit small business. So you can be a new business if anyone has that question but you must be um, actually in business and for profit. Um, personal net worth of the applicant does not exceed 1.32 million. And um, we talked again about what that entails and what's excluded, which would be your equity in your business and your equity in your, resi um, your residence. Um, US citizen or lawfully admitted permanent resident and the business is independent. So if all of those things are checked, then we move on to the actual application. There will be the instructions, the application, and the mailing instructions. So this is what I was speaking of. If you click on mailing instructions um, on, their, um, on their site, it will actually just show you the Caltrans, the Sacramento um, address. However, it'll give you an option if you wanna choose um, another area um, to click on that. And you can do that and then that you can look by region and see where your application should actually be sent. So well, let's see, we have a couple of questions here. So um, someone's asking, so if my business is only one year, one years, one year old, is it, does it qualify? And the answer is yes. Um, is a retirement plan counted at 100%? So I'm not really sure, but the, the value that you have of your, of your plan is counted. So maybe we need to have a, a follow-up question or a site question at the end about more specifics there. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. I think there's one more, let's see what that is. Okay. Um, it said used to be 40%. So actually, I am not sure about that. Um, from my understanding, you know, whatever value you have in your, your, your retirement plan is counted. So I would have to double check that, but I can double check and get back to you on that. Okay, 
So as I mentioned, I'd like to start with the supporting documents first, gathering this information because this helps you with actually completing the application. Um, so, and also just a side note, if you're you know, working on other certifications, of, you know, other than like um, an 8A certification, perhaps this covers a lot of what you'd need to gather for some of the other certifications like supplier clearinghouse or you know, things you may need for a small business certification with the state of California. So it's good for you to just gather all of this information first, and then again, it will help you with the app. So let's talk about what's required first for all applicants. That's this first column here, um, the first three quarters of the column, I should say. And, you know, we talked about resumes, how they include places of employment with corresponding dates, and they also, what they're not saying here, but what is very important to include your daily duties with the work that you do. Also, perhaps maybe it's your education um, or certifications that you have that show that you have experience in this area and that you, know, you are uh, qualified to do this work. Um, your personal net worth statement, we'll review that specifically, but um, it needs to be completed for each socially and economically disadvantaged owner comprising 51% or more of the ownership percentage of the applicant firm. So just that particular person um, that's making up this 51% or more. If there's more than one um, owner, then that would be two. Um, but a lot of times it's usually one person. Your personal federal tax returns for the past three years, um, your federal tax returns and any extensions filed for the firm and affiliated with um, and its affiliates with related schedules for the past three years. So just your tax returns for your business and your um, personal. Now, if you've not been in business for three years, again, you're a new business, then you provide um, what you have, or if it's just a brand new business, you know, you would basically, I would put a, a cover sheet in here and just put, you know, not applicable or not applicable or put a cover letter, or excuse me, a memo stating that the business start date was, you know, whatever it was, and we have not um, been required to file tax returns at, as of yet. So, and that just leads me to something else I'd like to say just in general, a tip is to always address each section, each checkbox that you see, if it's applicable. Now, I'm not saying if you are a sole proprietorship to address the corporation or LLC, section, but I'm saying like for required documents for all applications, all applicants, excuse me, if it doesn't apply to you, I would uh, check it off and list not applicable or put a cover sheet and, some, and list not applicable in that section. That way they know that you did see it, you did address it, and it makes it easier for the reviewer, which we all want. Um, let me just see a couple questions here. Okay, I'm going to address those questions at the end um, because they're just, just trying to stay on topic, but I will address those questions. Um, so we talked about tax returns, proof of contributions. Um, I, I often have companies ask about this. You know, they've said that I've, I've had the company for 20 years, you know, and I'm just now applying for DBE certification. I don't have the original documents of documentation of what I use to purchase the business. Um, or in some cases, it's like I just, you know, started the business with nothing. So they may add a memo that states the business was started with sweat equity. You know, there was there were no funds contributed or I opened a checking account. A lot of times that's the case. And I put one hundred dollars in there and that's what I used to start the business. In the case of construction firms, which is a lot of what um, we're catering to here, you know, you probably purchased some equipment. So, you know, equipment receipt would show proof of contributions to start the business. Um, so if you have any signed loan and security agreements, if not, again, list not applicable. Um, same thing with list of equipment and vehicles owned and leased. So a lot of times in construction, you will have these things. So you will list these out. But if you're outside, for instance, of professional services, Perhaps you just have a computer or something to that extent. If it's dedicated to the business, you would list that. Um, titles, registration certificates, and USDLT numbers, again, with like trucking firms. Um, licenses, I would enclose your business license here as well as your, you know, your um, 
um, your contractor's license as well, um, permits and hauling authority, any type of license that you have, you would put in that section. Um, and then description of any and all real, real estate, um, office space that you own or lease by your firm and documented proof, proof of ownership and lease. So maybe a lot of times uh, companies don't own the building, but they lease the space, so they'll put a copy of their lease agreement um, in this uh, section. Um, proof of any transfers of assets to or from your firm. So what they're looking for here is just to make sure that, um, for instance, your firm is really a large business, so you transfer some assets to your grandmother so that you will still appear small. Um, so they're, and they look back over two years. So maybe if you did that, you know, a year ago in preparation for applying for the certification, they're looking just to make sure that that didn't occur. I really don't find that firms are really doing that, but that is the purpose of that, just to ensure that this stays available for small businesses. Um, and then if you have any certifications currently, for instance, if you have, um, a DBE with another state, for instance, and are you certified as an 8A with the SBA, um, MB, MBE, WBE with um, supplier clearinghouse or something, you list all of those there. And hopefully you don't have to listen, list any denials or decertifications. Um, you know, they may ask you about that. That, again, may be one of the things that brings up additional questions. Um, let's see. So someone asked, and this is uh, specific to this section, so I'll, ask, I'll answer this. For documented proof of contribution, does a company gifting shares disqualify? What proof would be shown for that? Does a company, so a company gifted shares to you? Um, um, I just want to clarify that there. Um, yes, like, a bonus they gifted shares to you and then that made you the majority owner and that that made you the owner of the company that's kind of a a unique situation um so proof of contribution in general is just what you use to start the business or who whoever so that's what they're referring to if you received additional shares and you were already the owner of the company that would just be um, listed in your, your ledger. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So bank authorization and signatory cards. A lot of banks don't provide the traditional um, signatory cards that they used to, but if they don't, if your bank doesn't, just have them write a letter on their letterhead that's you know, list your account number and your account name and that the account is in good standing, sign it, and that will um, suffice for that section. So schedule of salaries, um, questions that I hear here, um, hear about in this section are, um, perhaps I don't take a salary, or salary, I take salary when I can. So write a memo to that effect that I don't um, draw a regular salary and, you know, I take it as available or something to that extent. Um, if you do have salaries, of course, list those out. List of employees, that would include you. So if it's, it's just you, then list you, your job title, and your dates of employee, employment. And if you have a warehouse or storage facility, same thing there. You know, provide the document or list not applicable so they know that you, again, address that section. So that's going to be required for all applicants. So now if you are a partnership or joint venture, you'll need to enclose those documents. Um, if you're a part of a corporation or LLC, you'll see the corporate documents, the um, articles of incorporation, shareholders agreement and so forth, minutes are required. And then if you are an LLC, you'll see the certificate of formation and operating agreement is required for LLCs. The optional documents to be provided on request, I would like to leave those there. I recommend provide it on request. So if they request them, then you provide them. You don't necessarily um, need to include that up front. Sorry about that. Let's see if it's um, okay. I there's some come some really long questions coming in. I'll address those at the end. Okay. Um, and then here's um, one note. This again still would be optional documents required. Uh, provided, excuse me, on request. 
Um, and I have this note here about proof of, proof of ethnicity. And so sometimes we find that our driver's license or our driver's license don't state what we are. But obviously there's a picture of us and maybe, you know, it's very clear that I am African American. However, um, the Caltrans wants to make sure that there is proof, meaning on your birth certificate, showing that you are the race that you say you are. Um, and a lot of times they'll do that verification piece when they come out, um, just confirming. And if you have an, a problem with the documents that you do have, meaning they don't state your race, then you can go to, um, for instance, a chamber like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and they can verify that you are um, the race that you state that you are. Okay, so let's look at the application now. So we've gathered all our documents, we have everything together, and hopefully some of what we've gathered there will help us answer the questions here. So obviously section A is a basic contact information that's self-explanatory. Um, section B is your firm currently certified. We talked about that again on the actual requirement list. So you'd list, you know, the agency that you're certified with and the dates. Um, again, denied certification or decertified. Now section two, the general information, your business profile. If you have a, a capability statement, a lot of times you'll have a, um, a summary paragraph about your business, when your business was formed, what your business does, what you specialize in, sometimes what area you work in. So that is usually um, a, good, a, a good document to pull this business profile information from. So, you know, descriptive, you know, your company, what your, your pro company, your product, or what product or service, excuse me, your company offers. Um, and then, you know, just a description of what you do. Um, so applicable NAICS codes for this line of work. And so your NAICS code, I have a, a link here, which it is an active link when you have this, um, where you can look up and see, if, again, that's- well, anyway, I'm just gonna let her draw on and see if there's something at the end. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, <laughs> Is someone there? Someone? So um, the business profile, again, you list a paragraph there. And then for number two, applicable NAICS codes for this line of work, um, they include, you, you'll look it up on the census and for your product or service, you'll list which codes apply to you. List the dates the firm was owned, um, established and owned. So maybe it was established and then you purchased it. List the date that you purchased it, if that's applicable. Okay, um, I talked a bit about, you know, the gross receipts. If you're not, you haven't been in business for three years, you can just list the years that you have been in, in business. Um, list the type of business you're running, sole proprietorship, partnership, LLC, and so forth. Um, and is your business for profit or not? So if it's not for profit, again, it doesn't qualify. So here in these sections, they're kind of verifying what it is, um, just trying to determine if there's any affiliation. If your firm is co-located with other businesses, are they sharing facilities, um, employees, you know, financing, thing of that, things of that sort. So trying to determine if there's any affiliation. Okay. Okay, so we talked about what funds, equipment were initial investments um, and how you determine what that would be. So that's the section that would go in number 10. Um, but this is this section three is for the majority owner in general, just listing your particular, your specific information, your ethnicity, how you qualify, that you meet the US citizen or lawfully admitted permanent resident status. Um, and then, it kind of, again, it's trying to see if in section B here, B1, are there, is there a familial relationship to other owners and employees? So they, and it's not that it's necessarily a problem because a lot of times people are in business with their family members, but they do want to um, be aware if there's a, a family relationship. Oh, I think I skipped forward a little bit. Um, oh no, I didn't. Okay. 
one more. Okay. Um, so again, all of these questions are revolved, revolved around um, just confirming that your firm is independent and also um, it's you know for profit and it qualifies. <clears throat> Okay, so the ownership information that's continued, if you identify all individuals, firms, or holding companies that hold less than 51% ownership in the firm, and this is where you would list that information here, if you have a, a partnership or owner, you know, more than one owner, and it asks, you know, the same types of questions, but just for that um, minority owner. Now, the control section. Um, again, this is an important part of certification, whether or not you control the business. So here you're going to list the officer of the company, the title, the date they were appointed, the ethnicity or gender, which, show, which basically qualifies them um, from an initial standpoint. And then you'll move that down to do any of the persons listed above perform a management or supervisory function for any other business. So are you, um, you know, working full time for a company and then working for, the, um, for this business as well? And perhaps you're able in this case to management, manage it. There's not a specific rule against that for DBE, but um, you know, they do want to know how much time are you dedicating basically to the business to show that you are in control of the business. Um, and so if you work for any other firm, we kind of talked about that. And then the duties, this is really important. The duties of the owners, officers, directors, managers, and key personnel. So the 51% owner, they have a list of things here, for instance, set policy for company direction, scope of operations. So are you the one that decides what direction the company is going in, um, what it is that you're going to do, how you're going to manage operations? Are you the one that makes the final say on that? Um, and sets that um, tone. So from that, you would list A for always, F for frequently, S for seldom, or N for never. So if this is a you know 51, 49% owner for all of the key performing areas, there may be some things that a minority owner may do. He may be he or she may be designated to do. But as far as the decision making, the final say, that should all point to the majority owner. The applicant. Okay, and again, just complete for all officers, owners, again, just like we did as far as those who are involved in the company listing their name as a minority owner. Now we're going to list their name as, a, excuse me, list their duties as far as where they fit in as far as helping with these things, bidding and estimating major purchasing decisions, marketing and sales and so forth. Um, let's move down to inventory and equipment. So here you're going to list, again, um, the make and model of any vehicles that the company owns, the current value. Um, and in some cases, for instance, if you're a professional services firm, you may not have much to list here, and that's okay. Um, and then office space. Um, then um, you would list that if you owned or if you lease, you'd list the um, the address of where you lease. So um, let's see. If you don't have one single majority owner, do you leave that blank? We have four disadvantaged owners that cumulatively own more than 51%. So are all the um, owners considered applicants? Um, so is it, I guess I would want to know like, so four disadvantaged owners that cumulatively own more than 51%. How much of them make up the 51%? Four out of the five owners, okay, got it. Four out of the five owners are eligible DBE applicants. So then you would, yes, you would include those three. So you would list those, those four, excuse me, those four out of the five owners to make up the 51%, whoever makes up the 51%. Because we need to have 51% um, percent disadvantaged individuals. So anything, uh, if only three of those people make that up, you can include those three. But in your case, four out of five make up that 51%. Those are the four that we would list.
monthly payment, they're actually property value. So um, I've seen it listed both ways, honestly. Um, Meg is asking, will the value of a lease be the monthly payment or the actual property value? So you can look up the property value, for instance, on something like Zillow and list that, but I would definitely list um, the, the lease, the monthly lease amount, because that's what you're responsible for. If you don't own that property, then, you know, you don't necessarily need to list that, but I've seen companies list both. Okay. This is more just about the storage space, um, the financial banking information that we gathered when we were pulling together our checklist. Um, and identifying all sources, amounts, and purposes of money loaned to your firm, including financial institutions. So if you received any funds, if you took out a loan from the, for the business, you would list it here. Um, we talked a bit about in section G contribution of transfer or transfers of assets to or from your firm or to or from any owners or an, of an or another individual over the past two years. Those are things they want to look at to make sure that you are truly a large business transferring firms of uh, uh, funds out to someone else. Um, current licenses. We talked about that. So again, by having put together that checklist, you've already got these things um, pulled together and able to just kind of fill in the application. If you have a home office, um, that's okay. They will visit you at your home office um, for the site visit. Um, there is a question about the trust, if the assets are in the trust. So you would list that on your personal financial statement, which we'll get to. And they may require you to send a copy of the trust, but they may not. Okay. And so like I have a note here, if you don't have past or active jobs, it's okay, but please be aware, be sure to answer all the questions. So it's okay if you don't, you know, have active work, um, but list what you do have here. In some cases, like I had one recently where they have a um, kind of like an MOU to do certain work, a memorandum of understanding, and they haven't actually started that work there, but they have a value of what that work would be uh, worth for the year. So they would list that there. Um, you may not have active jobs or you may have just three contracts or less than three contracts. So just, you know, list what you have. Um, let's see what we have here. And then don't forget to, this will be at the end when everything is done. I wouldn't notarize before, but before you are done, you will need to basically attest that you are who you say you are. You are um, socially and economically disadvantaged and the presumed group that you qualify under, you'll need to check that off and then have this notarized prior to sending in. So um, someone asked who approves the application. Um, the application is approved by the underwriting department at whichever agency you send it into. So if your area, if you're, excuse me, if you're located in the Sacramento area and it goes to the headquarter office, then the headquarters um, office's underwriting team will uh, approve your application. Um, there's no, someone asked about a notary of which notary you can use. There is not any um, specific ruling on which notary, it just needs to be a, you know, a registered notary. Okay. So let's look at the personal net worth statement. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, if, if some of you have completed this, perhaps if you've pursued a loan um, with the SBA, they have a similar form or pursued an 8A certification, they have a similar type form. Um, so basically you're listing assets and liabilities and showing that your personal net worth falls within the guidelines is really the gist of this. Um, uh -oh. Let's see, I think I clicked the wrong thing. I'm trying to see what the question is. 
Right, and so the application and all supporting documents are mailed by U.S. mail, not electronically. That is correct. They have not moved to the online process yet. Um, so list cash and cash equivalents. Um, and see, and someone asked about the trust, as I mentioned on the personal net worth statement, your assets that are held in the trust will be listed here. So they will be included. Um, <clears throat> And retirement, 401ks, again, those aren't um, excluded. You would list that here. IRAs, 401ks, someone also asked about IRAs. All of that would be listed here. Um, and then as far as life insurance, so this is for life insurance that has a cash surrender value only. So you have, if you have a term life policy, um, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be included as an asset. And... Um, with that, if you have cash surrender value on a life insurance policy, there may be a loan on that value. So you would list that value here as a liability if that's applicable. And then the mortgages on real estate, which will be on the next page as well, um, excluding the primary residence debt, you would complete section four, which will be on the next uh, slide. Um, the question is, how well this blends contracts with public art and performing art and enrichment education programs? I'm not exactly sure about the question, but um, I will say that this is primarily, again, for transportation projects. So those in construction-related um, uh, firms, small businesses. However, as I mentioned in a previous slide, many agencies within California do recognize the DBE certification, so perhaps you know, there will be a, um, a local agency or a county that would recognize the cert that, and it would be applicable for you. If they put a bid out there for uh, performing arts and they wanted to ensure that they were using a minority business enterprise, they may use a DBE as a way to confirm that. Okay. Um, notes and notes payable. Let's see, so let's move to page two. If you have any stocks, bonds, brokerage accounts, you would list those here and then list the properties, including the primary residence. So you list the primary residence, but it would not be included. Um, and then property B and C is if you had any rental properties, then those would be listed there. And that would count, the equity from those properties would count towards um, your personal net worth. Life insurance, I discussed, that will be disclosed here. And personal, uh, other personal property and assets, this is like a combination of different things that you may own. Um, this list is not all in inclusive, so you may just have household goods, jewelry, and so forth that's worth $10,000 or something like that that you could list. Um, that's kind of subjective. Um, someone asked if, uh, let me see, if owners are just partners, but they have their husbands, if owners are just partners, but they have their husbands and file their taxes jointly, do we have to include our husband's value as our own? Hope that makes sense. Um, I'm thinking you're saying that the owners are partners, but each is married and, and has, has a spouse. You would only include um, what your value, what your um, personal net worth. You complete the personal net worth statement just for yourself. Um, is a property, if the property is in an LLC, do we need to list it? Yes, um, because it still has it's still property that you own. It's just the LLC, and unless you are not the well, if, if you're not the primary for that LLC, you don't own it under the LLC, then no. But if you do, then yes. Um, how are you notified about the application, whether it's approved or denied? Also, about how long does this process take? And will your business be automatically added to the DBE list? So we'll take those one at a time. How long? How are you notified about the application, whether it's approved or denied? You would be notified um, by email, typically, if there's a, as far as a clarification, I should say. You'll be notified, you'll be sent a letter in the mail if you're um, denied, <clears throat> and with the points that you can respond to in the process for going through a response. 
Um, the typical turnaround is they're saying 90 days, but depends on which agency you go to. It may be a little less, it may be a little more, but 90 days is um, the typical turnaround. Um, and your business will be automatically added to the DBE list on Caltrans website once the whole process is complete. So I think um, someone asked this that again, if the property is in an LLC, and um, I mentioned that if you are the managing member of that LLC, then you um, effectively own the property, then you should include it. Okay, um, so we talked again about other personal property and assets, and then if you had any other liabilities and unpaid taxes, for instance, if you owe taxes, but as long as you have an arrangement with the IRS, you would include a copy of the letter um, where you have an agreement set up, and then you'd list the amount here um, that you owe to the IRS. And the value of other businesses, investments, or other businesses own, excluding the applicant firm. So again, if you have another firm, you'd list that here. Again, this form also needs a notary as the other one does. And that would complete the personal net worth statement. Okay, so let's look at a fully assembled package. And I'm gonna take you off here. Wow, that's moving slowly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is also posted on Caltrans website, but just so you can see what a sample submission would look like. Um, if you enlist with the um, PTAC, I will also send you a copy of this along with, you know, how to get started. And also, um, as Christina mentioned, we can help you fully put together the package under the program. So you can send us a documentation, we can review it. Um, assemble it and send it out for you if that's what you would like. Also, just to note that Caltrans has an analyst of the day that can answer um, your questions if you get caught on something. I mean, we're here to help you as well, but Caltrans also has, again, an analyst of the day um, and it rotates between um, different people who are, you know, processing applications for that day. And this is just, again, we're just going to kind of move through this pretty quickly, just what the application would look like um, when it's completed. So in this case, they put general A licensed contractor specialized, specializing in roadway construction and paving. Um, In this case, this firm has been in, in business a while. And so, so here they addressed it by this business is located in an industrial complex that houses other unrelated operations. So just showing that they are co-located, but does it impact their business? Now here's a majority ownership, owner, excuse me, of the company. This person owns a company with his wife. And then this number here will represent whatever, the, when we review the personal net worth statement, um, this is the personal net worth that your difference between your assets and your liabilities. And And then here's a section on control showing, you know, the ownership and control. And then here's a section on duties, how things are divided up. So there's, you can see there are some things that are frequently, but on these key activities, there's usually nothing that's never, you know, um, something may be, unless it's just not applicable to your business at all. But, um, 
you know, performing office management for a firm of a certain size, you know, they, they may seldom do that. They may use someone, yes, in the office or accounts payable department or something to do that. So seldom makes sense. Um, so that's just kind of a look at how that would pan out. And this person would be the minority owner and it shows what um, things that they're doing, which are frequently, and they're actually responsible for the billing accounts receivable and so forth. List of equipment, where an item is stored. Bonding information. And contractor's license. And then list of projects like we were talking about, if you have those. Notarization. And there's a supplemental questionnaire that I didn't review, um, but it is part of the application. And just checking off that, you know, confirming your firm's principal place of business in California. There are a few questions here. And then um, if you've ever been DLT, done business with um, DLT. And then what areas do you prefer to work? So listing those counties that you prefer to work in. If you do have a contract that's coming up, your application can be expedited if you know there's a, a contract that uh, requires a DBE and you need your application expedited so you'll actually be a um, certified DBE prior to the bid opening. You can list that here. We review the document checklist and here's a personal net worth statement. So again, you can look at all of this um, in detail on Caltrans website and there will also be links at the end of the presentation um, to go directly uh, to this to this site. And here's the documentation. So the sample birth certificate I, I spoke with you about, you know, showing um, the race of the person, your resume showing your work experience. Um, Your roles and responsibilities with this company, your duty statements, which could be part of your resume as well. So here's a proof of capitalization narrative, an example of what they, they use to um, start the business. And a receipt. So there's quite a bit here. I'm not gonna actually review the entire thing, but I wanted you just to kind of get a good glimpse of what a package should look like. And, okay, just wanna make sure you are seeing, we're back to seeing the slides. Yeah, um, and there's some other, um, questions here. So can someone confirm that you're seeing the slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so some of the questions here. So section J, what to put if we are an engineering consultant and work for owners, not prime contractors? It's, it's basically, I'm not sure, I can't remember it was section J, but if you are you're the owner of your business and you work as a consultant for the owners of a prime. I'm not sure the question. I need a little more clarification on the question. Um, so if a birth certificate does not show Native American blood degree, do we need to include the certificate with the BIA or a CDIB? You, you can include your card. Your card is acceptable. Um, and then this person, I think, Nick Riddle, um, so you are the property owners of a firm. Let me see. So the bottom line is, and I'm, I'm not sure if I, I just want to make sure I get it correct, is that you need to own the firm. The disadvantaged individual needs to own the firm. 
So if you're working for the firm and wouldn't qualify, if you own this firm that you're trying to get certified, even if you contract with others, but if you own this firm and you meet the requirements as far as being disadvantaged, as far as socially and economically disadvantaged, you can still get this firm certified. Um, You just need to list a license. Someone asked about licenses held by all employees or just DBE eligible owners, just for the DBE eligible owners. Does a woman owned business qualify as DBE? Yes. Okay, so let's go back to the slides for a moment. And um, so we already looked at the forms as far as review, note, sign, notarize, and then we'll mail the application package to the certifying agency. And again, you'll pick the one um, and you'll see from the application list, there's a spot where it shows the different counties and which agency is responsible for underwriting it. So once the application's in, you should receive an email, but I've found some recently that haven't, um, stating that your application has been received and assigned to an analyst. Um, then the analyst would review and assess your eligibility. They may come back to you with clarification questions in between that time, but um, just to confirm that the 90 days is from the date that everything is received. So if there are clarification questions going back and forth, your 90 days does not start until everything is considered received. And then once received and they've reviewed everything, then a site visit would be conducted before determination. Um, so that's important to note because um, Sometimes people, when they send the application and they think, oh, well, I'm done now. I sent the application, everything's in. But they do, the so site visit is a very important part of determining whether or not you qualify. So, and I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes about um, um, some of the questions that they, are types of things they may ask on a site visit. Here's a processing flow chart. Um, so what happens when your application is received is just more detailed than what I actually just reviewed, but this is just a detail of whether it would go forward or whether it would move back. It's good to know how your application um, moves through the process. So you can review this on your own when you receive the slides. Okay, so let's talk about the site visit a little bit. I'm first going to see if... Um, a couple of questions. You mentioned once you cer you're certified, you stay certified. I found my SB DVBE cert. Why, what do I do next to confirm and proceed? So SB DVBE cert is, you know, a different certification. That's with the uh, Department of General Services. And you do need to renew that one. But for this particular certification, you do need to send in a renewal letter as well but Caltrans considers once you've been approved, you, as long as you don't fall outside of the guidelines, you, you maintain the certification. It doesn't expire. Um, is it a good practice to send the application via USPS certified or priority requesting a signature? I think that's a very great question. It's always a good, um, good idea to send it with a signature, requesting a signature in any case. Um, and if you are completing the application and working with us, we'd like you to send us a copy of that signature receipt so we can let Caltrans know that we've um, assisted you with putting your application in and it's in, um, it's in for processing. So it is highly recommended that you uh, request a signature, keep a copy, and also send us a copy. And I think maybe Stacy will speak to that um, at the end. Uh, Stacy's our DBE program manager. Um, what do you inherit? What do you do if you inherit an existing DBE and you qualify? Do you have to reapply? Yes, because you need to be the applicant. Um, and how to check if we are already certified? There's a DBE search um, on Caltrans website, which will be part of the resource links at the end of this uh, slide presentation. And you can just, it just, or you could just Google um, DBE search and it should bring you to the page where you can just you know put in your information and see if you are certified but if you didn't keep up with the annual renewable form you may not show as certified um, will NorCal PTAC send a link to the recording of the presentation to all participants 
uh, yes, I believe the, the audio as well as the presentation will be sent out to everyone who participates today. Okay, so why is it required to have an on-site evaluation of my business? It's a um, 49 CFR requires it. The certifying agency must interview the applicant and perform an on-site visit per this um, federal regulation um, to visit their job sites if applicable. So they've made it a part of the requirements at, um, at the federal level to have a site visit. Um, there are other certifications that do require site visits as well. Um, and some of them have the option not to exercise them, but this one it's required before the certification um, is given. So I already talked about this, the annual update affidavit. If you are a certified firm, and you just need to submit this annual update affidavit um, de declaring there's no change or confirming there is change. Um, so, you know, these are the things that you need to submit your past year's tax, um, taxes for the firm and you'll receive a 60 and a 30 day notice, you know, just reminding you. But I would definitely calendar, calendar this to make sure that you don't forget and that you make sure you get that in. Okay, um, Renee, I would let, let's talk offline about the ethnicity um, with your parents. And Jenny has, how about I don't have job site yet? So does that mean, I believe that means you work from home, that's fine, they will visit you at your home office. No, um, for Kim, the business start date remains, uh, she has an HVAC business, started in 2005 as a sole prop, then changed it to S Corp. So it was, it was started in 2005, you just changed the formation type. Okay, we've asked, we've answered a lot of questions. I've asked a lot of questions, but here are some other um, frequently asked qu questions that we'll cover. This is just really just an acronym chart just some of the acronyms that you'll see um, just for, your, for you to have as a reference tool. So how can I prove my group membership? So birth certificate, your parents or your grandparents' parents' birth certificate, um, naturalization papers, passport, these are some of the things. So I don't find that passports actually have, you know, list what your race is. Um, and birth certificates, it, it just depends. Some of them do, some of them don't. But um, again, you could also go to like your local chamber, um, Hispanic chamber, African American chamber, and um, get verification that you are the race that you are um, presumed to be. Is this, um, yeah, document must indicate group membership. Which business owner should complete the personal financial statement? The majority disadvantaged owners. So those who make up the ownership control, that's a 51%. And I think someone also asked this question earlier, but yes, those who make up the 51% are the ones that need to complete the personal financial statement. Can I be considered a DBE if I do not fall within the presumptive groups? So I addressed this briefly also earlier, but yes, um, but you must provide evidence that you are socially and economically disadvantaged and this approval just know that that's on a case-by-case -case basis if it's not already um, you're not already a part of one of the presumed groups is there a car a cost no only the cost for notarization and postage so there's no cost for this certification what is the determination on the eligibility of firms owned by an american indian tribe any American Indian tribe may, be, may own a DBE firm as an entity, however, the firm must be controlled by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. Like, for instance, one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the participants um, if, who is the owner of the firm that provides their tribal card, that would be the one that controls, would be the socially, um, would prove their social economic status or social status.
what are my appeal rights if I'm denied DBE certification? So you may appeal by response and writing within 90 days of your denial letter. Um, or you can wait a year, usually they give you a year and then you could reapply if you'd like to do that, um, choose to do that. Okay, and in the case, uh, Alice is asking the question about, you know, she doesn't have a birth certificate, her parents are deceased and um, were naturalized. But if you don't have your, if your birth certificate doesn't say race or some other documents, I've had um, a client recently that used a court document that stated his race um, and that was accepted. So there are other documents that you may be able to use that do state your race. They really don't like to use the genealogy um, documentation, but you know, they've accepted it. But I would recommend that you go to, um, like I could say, a some type of chamber of commerce representing um, your race and have them provide proof of your um, ethnicity. So what if you're a new business two years and have not filed your taxes? So if you've been in two year, business two years, you probably have been required to, to file one tax return. And so you would either need to produce that tax return or an extension. But if you're a brand new business and you don't have tax returns, then you just need to state that. Okay. I'm a prime, how can I find certified DBE firms? And, and someone else was just asking about how can they find out if they are a DBE firm? So here's a direct link to that, to certified firms who are listed in the DBE directory. So there may be a, a little a waiting period, but you will be um, transitioned into this DBE directory once you're, you're approved and certified. So now I'm certified, what do I do? Um, and this is not, honestly, some of these things are not just for DBE, for, but for any certification as far as just the general steps that you need to take and things that you need to do. But we'll also talk specifically about, you know, Caltrans opportunities, how to locate those. So being proactive, of course, um, and marketing your product or services. So that means that you need to get out and meet the primes. You need to proactively pursue opportunities by being a, um, a PTAC client. If you sign up for our bid match service and we get you connected with that, you'll start to receive bids. So kind of following up on what you see out there that comes up under the keywords that we entered for you, making sure you follow up as far as attending those pre-bid meetings, um, reaching out to those prime contractors, and I'm gonna view a couple of sites where you can also find other crime, uh, uh, excuse me, primes. And networking, going to matchmaking events. We host several. There are many, Caltrans hosts a lot of events. They just um, recently hosted a meet the buyer event. So attending those events, make sure they know who you are um, and be prepared. And that's what the capability statement, for those of you who don't know, I mentioned like your one page business flyer that the government recognizes, which describes what you sell, it lists your codes, it lists your certification numbers, um, it lists um, a little bio about your business perhaps, and past performance. What have you done before within, uh, within your market? Um, and then reviewing Caltrans advertising upcoming bids, which I think I have a, a slide here for that. So register for Caltrans Bidding Connect. So you register here so you can start being notified, particularly um, in construction of different opportunities that are available, primes that are looking for subs. You can also opt in on particular opportunities, um, stating that you're interested. And here's that slide here. So if you want to register, you'll, there are projects here that are advertised every week. They're uploaded on Mondays. And when you log in here, you'll see, or even if you don't log in, if you come on this site, you can just see what's available. But if you log in, and you've created that account, then you can select, um, you know, a prime. If you're a prime prime contractor looking for help, um, you can also opt in, you know, so that you could see for this, um, if you're a DBE, 12% DBE requirement, you want to opt in as a supplier that you're interested. And then when you click on these actual opportunities, 
um, it will list a full description of the project and a lot of times, you know, the bidder estimator or whoever is coordinating this, you reach out to that particular person um, to try to, to make a connection as far as for this opportunity or maybe a future opportunity. Um, and so start trying to build a relationship with that person. Let me see, I have a... Um, Um, okay, I'm going to, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the site visit, some questions at the end. Someone asked about that and so someone asked, once certified, can we get selected for teams by primes or opportunities where we can prime? So you can always prime if you are, you know, capable, you have the capacity to complete the work um, and you know to provide the bonding if that's needed. Um, do we have to look at websites ourselves and read each RFQ or is there a way where only those that have DBE requirements are identified? Um, well there may be keywords that identify them. like in this case they'll identify here if you're on Caltrans site 12% DBE requirement, 11% DBE requirement. So They'll identify that as DBE, but you may, yes, receive opportunities that don't have a DBE requirement by just listing, for instance, on our site, your keywords um, describing what you do. And again, I'll come back to the, um, the site visit, a little bit more detail on that. So these are contracts that are currently out to bid. You want to follow the contract, uh, Caltrans contracts that are bidding and make sure that there's something that's particular to you. So sometimes you're not in the position to bid yet, but you're trying to, again, get to know the primes, see if there is someone that you can partner with um, based on your, your DBE requirement, I mean, excuse me, your DBE certification, but more importantly, what you offer. So um, as you can see, there are things that are offered here that are outside of construction, you know, title and escrow services for El Dorado County, you know, linen and laundry services. So look for what look out here for what Caltrans has to offer and see if there's a pre-bid meeting in some cases or a contact um, if you're truly not ready to bid as a prime. Um, you will definitely receive the PowerPoint presentation if you signed up for this course, which you did. So we have your name and likely your email. So you will receive it within a day or two when Christina Kunkel sends it out to everyone who attended. This is the resource tool um, that I was mentioning, I think at the beginning of the slide. So a lot of the things that I covered, it will, you click on these links and it'll take you right to that page, like the contractor interest registry that we just reviewed. Um, this is a link to go right to that. The DBE certification forms that we reviewed, that's the link to go to Caltrans site and start your application. Um, finding certified DBE firms, we talked about that. Um, this will have a, a list of anyone who's certified um, or if like if a prime is looking for a, a DBE firm, they may go out to this site to search as well. Um, and then looking for a particular Cal Caltrans Bidding Connect, we just reviewed that, but there's also contracts under 314,000 that you can look at smaller contracts. So again, these are resources, you can click on them, review them, and if you have any questions, you can always circle back to us um, at the PTAC, we can assist you with, you know, your specific questions <clears throat> or specific bids, for instance, that you want to bid on and have questions about. So these are links to, um, here's a link to our site, but also if you need general business assistance, there is the SBDC, the NorCal SBDC, you can click on their link. The National, the Association of PTACs, if you are outside of our region, you can find your local PTAC there. And you can also find your local SBDC. That's the, national, the link to the national site for SBDC if you're outside of the NorCal uh, PTAX region. Okay, so let's see what other questions we have. Um, so this question is pretty lengthy, let me see. We fall pretty squarely into your construction example. My husband holds five C license classifications and is listed as the RMO on CSLB. 
I run the day-to-day -day operation of the business and generally have the final say with business concerns and he performs sales, service, and some field management. We also have a general manager that manages the office staff, so I do not technically manage the employees. I, am I understanding correctly that we would not qualify as a woman-owned business if I do not hold the licenses? We are listed as 60-40 ownership on our corporate docs. Likely no, if um, yes, because he's listed as the RMO and Caltrans is really strict about um, you holding the license for the service or the service that's provided. So um, I've seen cases even where, you know, there's a husband and wife in your situation and she did obtain a license, but the, the business existed for about 15 years based on his license. So she obtained a license like a year before they applied for, or not even quite a year before they applied for a DBE certification and um, Caltrans denied it. So not to say those things are kind of a case by case basis, but I'm just telling you what I've seen and what I know that um, in some cases, I, in all cases, they really want you know, the applicant to hold the license. Um, but I've seen a case, for instance, another case just on the other end where a firm was 8A certified. So the person, um, the applicant was a woman, a Hispanic woman, and it was a brother and sister. And so um, she did not hold the license. He held the license. And, but they were, somehow they were certified with 8A, which, you know, in some way translated to them, they were able to be certified um, with Caltrans as a DBE. Typically that's not the case. They want you to hold the license. So, I mean, you could try, but just know that that may be an issue. Um, if we have SPE micro business, um, streamline application for Caltrans, no, not for Caltrans. No, those are two separate processes. Or if we are also getting DBE, if we are minority or woman, or for also getting DBE if we are minority or woman owned. So there's not a fast track process. There's a fast track process between uh, states. So if you wanna get a DBE with another state, then there's a fast track process. We are electronics repair. <coughs> Anyone have leads on companies looking for electronic buys via Apple? Um, for some reason my link is bought. Uh, so that's a, I think that's just a, a question, a general question that not necessarily to me. Um, I'm a white woman that holds the contractor's license for my business. Are white women considered to be socially and economically disadvantaged? Socially, yes. Economically is based on meeting the personal net worth standards. So as long as you meet that, yes, you qualify um, as a woman. Any other questions? Well, let me review while I'm waiting. You can start typing in your questions, but I'll review um, some things that come up on site visits. And this is something from a, a recent inspection. Um, so, you know, one of my clients that kind of gave me some feedback on what occurred at a recent inspection. So they conducted a one hour interview um, and they asked questions about the firm's operations, the process, who's in charge and who manages things. Um, I know for a fact, if you have, um, you know, other staff members, sometimes they'll just, if they're walking down the hall, they'll ask them questions to make sure they'll also observe if they, um, if someone seems to be the final say other than you, like the staff members are constantly going to them saying, what should we do about this? What should we do about that? Um, they asked about this person's clients. Where do they look for them? Um, how do they set their pricing? What technology is used? What portions of, um, you know, in this case it was systems development, what portion are they doing and what portion is outsourced? Um, they took inventory of um, their equipment and they also took photos of the person and the office, the business license and the company, company logo on the door. So um, that's just some of the things to just be prepared for. A site visit is very important again and is, is definitely part of the process of determining whether or not you qualify. Um, and then I talked a little bit about this proof of ethnicity, but I just wanted to go over some things that you can use. So Chamber of Commerce, I mentioned that depending on your ethnicity, um, you can go to your local chamber. 
school records a lot of times have, you know, your um, list whether what race you are. Birth certificates, we talked about that. That's, you know, on and off, depends. And also the genealogy records, not preferred, but, you know, they've accepted it before, but not preferred. Um, let's see, so coming back on from KJ, if you're a, home, you're a home based business, what are they looking for in your home? I just think I kind of covered those things, but they understand that a lot of the businesses are home based. So they'll just, um, they'll still look for certain things like you have a dedicated space for your business. You know, you may be a home office, but they'll meet you there in your home office and ask basically the same things that I just, the bullets that I just covered. But it won't be expected that, for instance, you have a logo on your door that was just that particular client did. Um, is it a schedule or a surprise visit? Can my cats be interviewed? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. You know, maybe give them a little name tag or something. But um, if it's definitely scheduled. It's not a surprise visit. Um, I'm eligible for WBE and MBE. Should I get certified in these also? So you will be considered a woman, a weeby meeby or whatever they call it, which is a woman, um, a woman, no, you'll be, I'm sorry, you'll be, yes, because you're a minority. So you'll be a woman minority business enterprise with Caltrans. You can also get certified with other agencies for that, but we can um, talk about that if you become a PTAC client. Any other questions? time. We have about 20 minutes. I'm gonna scroll back up because I do believe I missed a couple of questions up here when I was going through the slides. Um, and if I didn't answer someone's question and they posted it here and I'm skipping past it, past it please let me know. Um, if changes need to be made once you're certified, such as the areas you serve, I don't remember answering that one. How does this information get updated in the system so business prime contractors are getting the correct information about your business? So you would contract Caltrans about changes to your application and they would require you to, you know, submit that information and then they would update it on their end. Um, Oh, for a disadvantaged business enterprise, yes, Caltrans and their, you know, the agencies that support them offers a DBE only. Um, do you have to be in Northern California to be a PTAC client, I'm assuming you're speaking of? Um, yes, it is, um, you know, Christina Kunkel covered the, um, the map. <clears throat> it is a large portion of Northern California. Um, but the particular, the specific counties are, are outlined in the chart. It'll be like uh, slide three or four above. But just a note, this is Christina Kunkel. Um, there are PTACs across the state. So if you are located somewhere else, there were some links on here to find your nearest PTAC. You can also just send us an email. You can reply to the reminder email that you got about this webinar and we can help you find the PTAC nearest you. Right, and also there is, um, again, a slide, I mean, excuse me, a link here, APTAC, that's the Association of PTACs. That link will lead you to um, the national site where you can um, search for the PTAC in your area. In the beginning, there was counseling mentioned. So as a PTAC client, Christina, you wanna just go over that a little bit? What was the specific question? In the beginning, there was counseling mentioned. There's a question, you know, I guess you're just having a question about what type of counseling um, PTAC offers. Sure. I mean, it's counseling about anything. So, for example, if after this webinar you're thinking that you're interested in applying for the CBE certification, we can walk you through that. Um, but we can help you with anything that has anything to do with government contracting, and that includes federal, state, local, city, county, everything else. Um, so uh, it could be getting your SAM registration settled. It could be getting a DUNS number. It could be if you're bidding on proposals, 
we can help you um, review that proposal, make sure that it's complete, make sure that you've included everything. Um, we can also help you figure out which agencies to target so we can find out which agencies are already buying what you're selling. Um, I mean, really anything government contracting related and we do it all remotely so you don't have to leave your office. Okay. Um, thank you, Christina. Um, if we have any other questions, whom should we contact after this presentation? So, um, Christina Kunkel will be sending out the presentation and it would be your point of contact as far as any questions. And also, you could reach out to me. Um, she'll forward any questions that she receives um, uh, to me directly. She receives specific questions. Um, so we can just discuss your specific situation together. But if they're just general questions about how to get signed up with the with the PTAC or you know general questions about um, what PTAC services are, uh, Christina Kunkel and actually Taylor Bowles can help you with that. And you'll be receiving an email shortly. Um, it will have a link to where the recording will be posted. The recording takes a couple hours to process and post. So we're hoping that it will be posted by tomorrow. Um, that email will also contain a link with a survey. So we'd love to hear your feedback and um, please fill out that survey. We'll also send out a second email once everything's actually been posted to our website. Okay, so Eric is asking if I was placed on title of a property to avoid probate, do I list this personal net worth statement? So you're, if as long as you're owner of the property um and you're not on the mortgage you don't pay the mortgage but you own the property that that's the main piece i mean you could try to explain it off um with some documentation but you know for instance if they were to just to look it up if you weren't to include it and they were to do a um a search and find that you were on the property then it's you know it's an asset to you Our business is in District 6, but we do a lot of business in Regions 4 and 10. So I think you're referring to enrollment in the DBE program. And if you, and then for that one, it's basically by districts. Um, and we don't cover District 6. I think that District 6, I'm not as familiar with the districts that are outside our service area, but I believe that that's covered by Fresno State's office. Okay. Um, we can, if you email us, we can probably get you their contact information. I just want to answer one question that was directed about um, any fees. Are there any fees involved for PTAC services or any of the certifications? And there are no fees for PTAC services. We are a nonprofit. We're federally, state, and locally funded. Um, so it's always free to you. Um, there are not ever fees for the certifications per se, but like Christina mentioned, sometimes there are fees associated with getting items notarized or mailing or things like that. Um, and someone asks, let's see. Are you required to have a certain amount in business account to get projects? Each, pro, each if you're speaking of bidding on something, um, it's not a certain amount in a business account, but for instance, there may be a, bound, a bonding amount that you need to have in order to qualify. Each, in general, each bid is gonna be different. And um, you, so you'll need to look at each bid separately but also um, you'll want to be prepared to have your infrastructure built before you bid because in general you do need to have capital in order to bid and be successful be prepared um, and um, to wait 45 days for instance to be paid on projects so uh, that's just general but each bid again it's, it would be specific to each bid what's required can you help with teaching how prevailing wage works and what needs to be filed? We have um, classes on that. We have um, um, Ed Duarte, who teaches a prevailing wage course. And we just did it in Reading, and I'm not sure. I think it may be coming up in uh, Oakland, Oakland again uh, next month or this month. 
uh, San Leandro on December 14th, and that's on our calendar on our website. Okay. Um, if we have a home office as a sole proprietor, how do we evaluate this as a property asset? Can we use a property assessment and multiply the por proportion of the square footage of our office as evaluation? Yeah, well, in which section are you referring to? So, um, um, I'm just trying to think of what section are they asking for that information? Because you would just list your property on the personal net worth statement, your personal residence. And they would exclude it as including it in the valuation of your personal net worth because it's your personal residence. Um, and beyond that, I don't believe they ask for you to break it down as far as your home office, you know, the valuation of your home office. Christina, would you mind going to the next slide to show, I think that that's the event slide. Sure. So this has that December 14th one that we were just talking about. And Christina Jones will also be putting on two in-person workshops in Sacramento and Reading. So it will be similar content, but um, at the end, she'll have some one-on-one -on -one time to personally meet with people who have their DBE application packet ready for review. Christina, you can expand right. on that. So yes, it's a, it, it will be the, this presentation, similar, a little bit different because it's in person. Um, and then one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. So we'll basically have a sign-up sheet at the beginning of the uh, workshop where you can sign up for slots to meet with myself or Stacy Richardson. And we will review your applications if you have them ready. You know, there was someone, for instance, at our, the webinar, excuse me, the workshop I did in Oakland a month or so ago where they had their complete package ready. And so then we reviewed and swapped out documents and made changes. We did all of that real time on the spot and they were able to mail it out the next day. Um, or if you just have questions, you're in the middle of it or you just, and you want to review what you have so far, or if you just have just specific questions, you know, questions you don't want to necessarily discuss on a webinar or in a group and you want to meet one-on-one -on -one with us just to talk about um, your specific situation, we can do that as well. So that's a nice thing about the uh, in-person workshops. Um, let's see where we are. Can I attend the Caltrans D4 meeting in Oakland if I do not have my DBE certification yet? Yes. Um, are there any questions about these resources? Could we email a clarif for clarification or call? Yes. Definitely, you can um, email um, either myself or Christina Kunkel or any of us um, that are listed on the slide presentation if you have questions about the resources or questions or specific questions about DBE that you'd like to answer offline, um, we can connect. Um, and just I would say that the, the best way to get your questions answered is actually just to apply to be a client on our website. And then we can connect you with someone like Christina or someone else on our staff who will be your go-to resource. You can just ask them questions whenever you want. Um, I'm going to assume if you're filling out this application, you're probably going to have more than one question. <laughs> so it will be easier for us to connect you with that procurement specialist who will just be your go-to person uh, whenever you have questions. Okay. Well, they said they'd sign up. No, <laughs> that's a, that a different person. Okay. Um, any other questions? We we have ten minutes. Or did I miss anything? Okay. Great. Taylor shared the um, link to sign up to be a client. To apply to be a client. Hi, Christina, this is Stacy Richardson. Can I just add one thing? I know you went over the part about uh, if we are helping or assisting you in completing your DBE application. Yes. If you are sending it to the certifying agency, what we need in return is confirmation that that 
has been sent. So a delivery confirmation or one woman asked, would it be um, good to have a signature? Yes, a signed signature, some way that we know that that application did reach the certifying agency. And that's one of the reasons that, or one of the ways that we help keep our services free is by showing our funding agencies that we're actually helping you, we're actually doing these things. So um, proof of submitting an application is a way that we can show our funders that we're doing a good job. And the public works workshop, somebody asked if they can attend Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the, the November 8th, but the public workshop we have listed in, in Oakland, it's actually going to be in San Leandro at the Builders Exchange, and it's going to be a workshop that's going to be um, divided into two parts. The first part is for prime contractors who have to go through the good faith effort process. Ed would be covering that. And the second part is estimating pricing. Someone asked about certified payroll. That's the second portion of the workshop that he will be going through. So I suggest if you are in any kind of public works or you're looking to land public works contracts, you might want to attend the workshop on December 14th in San Leandro. Okay, so that was just um, the third bullet should say San Leandro instead of Oakland. Yeah, we just recently narrowed down the venue. It was okay. going to be in Oakland, but we've changed it to San Leandro. Okay. And it's, on, it's, it's updated on our website as well. Okay. All right, and then Taylor was answered the question about the PowerPoint. We've got a few more minutes here. I'll just add also um, that when I was reviewing the requirements checklist that, again, I recommend that you note that you've reviewed each requirement, each thing that they're asking for, and that is either enclosed or not applicable. And one way I recommend to do that is by placing a colored cover sheet in between each, for each document requested. And that sheet just helps separate everything for one, but then it also acknowledges that if you like create a, we're not in person, so I can't actually show you this, but if you have, for instance, create a little box and you have enclosed here and you have that checked off, or you write not applicable or you have that checked off. So that way they know if it's not applicable, they don't need to look further or if it's enclosed here and what might be enclosed behind it, might be um, a clarification letter. It might not actually be the document, but they can see that you've addressed each area that's required on the checklist. Um, PTAC, yes, can help with all types of certifications, including DGS, federal certifications for women-owned and minority and disadvantaged small business certifications. Yes, we can help with any um, certifications, um, any Thing that's required for government public work procurement. Um, so I'm a corporation. Do I need to have the actual minutes when I'm operating as president, secretary, and treasury? You will need, yes, to, to submit the meeting minutes. Um, and you can actually address all of that in one meeting minute document. So, but we can talk about that again, as Christina mentioned, you become a client and then we can really go through um, specifically how you set up your meeting minutes if you don't have it set up correctly or just review what you have. Um, also, if you attend the workshop, say for instance, you attend the workshop that we're having in Sacramento on December 7th and just attend for the technical assistance part for those of you who may be working on your applications now but have specific questions, you could also attend the workshop and uh, just either attend the whole thing and get a refresher or attend at the second half for the um, technical assistance, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Um, is the same application to apply for your business to be certified a small business? Same. 
Um, I'm not really sure about the question, but I think you mean, so the DBE application is a separate application than the small business application with um, Department of General Services, which you complete on Cal ePicure. Okay, great. All right. Well, I think that um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, but do feel free to um, reply. I just sent out the email with the request to fill out the survey. We'd love to hear your feedback. There's also a link to where the webinar will be posted as soon as it's um, done processing. The recording takes some time. Um, please, you can feel free to reply to that email if you have any simple questions or apply to be a client at the link that's also included in that email and we can get you set up with a specialist. And again, the reminder, our services are always free. So thank you all for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Christina Jones for a fantastic presentation and have a great day. One quick thing someone asked about, if you do submit the application, I'm sorry, um, and you send us a certified response, we will do what we can as far as to get in touch with the agency and yes, try to help track where it is. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.